How are you rock stars doing today? I'm doing, I'm doing fantastic. Um, I will start the sign-in sheet over here. You'll see it's got the date and a column. Just your name, something there. Don't just write an X. Uh, that was for me when I did it. <laughs> That's how I knew it wasn't, but just sign your name. Um, and uh, yeah, it's gonna take me a couple weeks to, um, well, or more to get everybody's name down. Um, so just bear with me. And I didn't bring in the sheet that has uh, the name you go by, so I apologize if I, if I do wrong by you today. I'll get better, I promise. I promise. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Did anybody attempt to take the quiz yet? No, sir. It's uh, due tomorrow. I'd still like you to at least try. Um, what were your first thoughts on it? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what I mean. And it, it worked well for you? Back here, the uh, it, was, it was easy. It wasn't bad. Simple. Simple. Okay, that might be the route that we go with. Um, with it, the only thing is, I wasn't sure. It didn't look like it had populated a grade in there, but I'll I'll double check later. Um, so I was just I think I had only seen a few in there. Yes. Also, your second syllabus quiz. That's like the easiest quiz I ever took. Good. Well, it wasn't meant to be hard. <laughs> so. So yeah, right here. Yeah, the one where you took yes. That's like the easiest. Piece. This is a syllabus quiz that I went over. You just have to take a quiz and write the word yes. That that's my way of acknowledging or you acknowledging that you got uh, the syllabus and it makes sense and you've had. Uh, questions uh, answered. And then this is how to use Inquisitive. It's a quiz on how to take the quizzes. I have never used it and I didn't get it until like the day before class. So rather than me write the quizzes I would want to give that probably are going to be a lot harder, um, I have this one. But it was different than anything I've ever seen as far as a quiz goes. So I didn't want to put it out there if you all hate it because I want you to enjoy this class. I didn't have enough time to kind of go around it, but it seemed, uh, I don't want to say juvenile, but it kind of seemed more like a game than a quiz. Um, the quizzes aren't worth a ton of points. It's 10% of your grade, uh, and there'll probably be some extra credit in there. So I just wanted to make sure I wasn't you know, setting you guys up to fail in the quiz portion of your grade. So if collectively people are like, yeah, it's easy, it's not that bad, um, then I'll go ahead and keep with it. But you do need to do this. And again, these quizzes, y'all, it might not be a lot of points, but uh, you don't have a lot of quizzes, right? You only have like 10 quizzes, they're all worth 10 points, um, something like that. So it kind of becomes sort of important to do them, but they're not when I looked at it, it didn't look like it was that hard. You could even click on a button and it'll take you to the page in the book that shows you where the answer is. You can, and you can do it multiple times if you need to. But as far as the whole betting, how many points you're confident on, that I wasn't sure how students would respond to it. I'm not a book publisher, so they probably know more than I do. Um, so I kind of will the general consensus I'm getting is that it's good. I will check again with you on Tuesday and make sure once everybody's done it that we're getting a good uh, good sample of everybody being like, yeah, let's go this route. And I'll start um, assigning them. So um, the chapters, just be aware, the chapters in the ebook and the quizzes, the, the inquisitives, they are different from how I might label uh, the module. So we might be on module one, but I'll have you read chapter six. So don't equate module number with chapter number because I didn't get enough time to really get the, the book and the order that I think things are important um, for you to learn to go together. So whereas they see kind of the first few chapters are, you know, completely um, analytic and things like that, then uh, I, I think talking about story and stuff like that will be more important to start. Um, looking ahead, uh, module one, which is now 
unlocked. I will put today's lecture right in here um, for you, but it's also in a PDF. If you need to go back to reference for assignments or whatever, and you don't want to listen to the whole thing, there's the PDF. Um, assignment one, I'm going to ask that you all close, unless you're following along with this, close down any electronic uh, for a few minutes with me, unless you're following along. That way I know you're getting this because I, I've already seen a lot of confused faces as to what's what, and I know I've gone over it because I have it on video. So <laughs> assignment one, let's take a peek. Fairly straightforward stuff. Um, I want you to go over what your relationship with film has been like. I want you to reflect on the following questions and begin um, to think deeper about the medium of film. Please keep a copy of your work because I may have you look over this at the end of the semester. If you've uploaded it, I reckon you can go back and see what it is you turned in uh, earlier. So, uh, you know, if you wanna keep it on your desktop or whatever, so that way you make sure you have it, just be sure to have it in a place where you can get to it. Um, answer the following questions in complete and academic sentences, um, meaning don't just write fragments. Um, follow the standards set out in the syllabus. Uh, what is the first movie you ever remember watching? What film has impacted you the most? Has any film ever really made you think deeper about anything profound, such as life, spirituality, love, the meaning of existence? If so, what film or films, and what was the impact? Um, why do you watch film? What is your reason for watching a film? For this course, just to get our verbiage kind of on the same spot, I'm not necessarily talking about TV shows, YouTube. Um, I'm talking straight, you know, hour and a half, two hour cinema. There'll be times we can kind of delve into other aspects and there is a lot of carryover between them, um, but we want to focus primarily on um, film. Um, if there are more that you want to add to it, like you're really into anime, things like that, uh, I do think that that translates over. Um, but, uh, you know, kind of try and stick to, to just cinema. Um, do you prefer to watch film alone at a theater? What are your surroundings when you watch a film? Um, what do you prefer? I'm at the point, like if I were to do this, there's nothing more like outside of going to church, like going to a movie theater is uh, like one of my favorite things to do, um, or it used to be, now I hate it. I absolutely cannot stand the price of everything. I can't stand the fact people are talking throughout it. I can't stand the fact that people are on their phones throughout it. I'm like, I just dropped 50 bucks on the, thank you, yeah, you get what I'm saying. The crappiest movie I've ever seen, some people brought their like newborn, or like I went to go see the new Batman, um, which there's so many of those going out. And it was nothing, the whole theater was lit up by everybody on their phones. And it was just so annoying because it takes you out of those moments, right? We, we go to time travel in a film to be a part of what this world is. And anytime we get distracted, we are pulled out of that world. We are no longer time traveling. We're back in that present moment. To me, it's like texting while you drive. Like you cannot text well and drive well at the same time. You might think you can, you might try it, but eventually you're going to be wrong, right? Your brain can't do those things at the same time. So I think it's the same for watching a film. Uh, so when we do watch things in here, I, you know, I'm going to ask that you're really reflecting upon up here and what's going on to allow yourself that time to just say, I don't have a damn thing in the world to worry about right now, except what's going on up here. Um, so just be cognizant of that and be aware of it. I know probably like, like me, I fall asleep to watching a film like this, right? On this incredibly small screen. And uh, it, it's sort of comforting in some ways. Like you're just there isolated with your, your headphones on or your earbuds or something and you're just in that world. But it's just not the same, I think, as uh, film was always meant to be a communal activity uh, too. We'll get into that. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little too passionate about what I believe in. Anyway, your next thing. I'm gonna pepper these in in your assignments here and there. Um, it's called Filmmaker IQ. There's some pretty interesting stuff. And this is where you'll kind of get a little bit of the history of film. They're not that long um, <clears throat> and it's kind of engaging. And what I want you to learn is the aspect ratio, what that is. I'll go more into it into a lecture, but it's kind of fun. Essentially your aspect ratio is the, um, the width by the height. And how has that changed over time um, with film? 
you know, when you watch some of those the old films and it'll be black on this side and black on that side, it has those pillar bars. What are those? Where do they come from? How have they been important in film? It's actually gone to the point of, of you know, how is your phone shaped has kind of played into it too. So it's kind of interesting and um, nothing hard, just how many do I have? Five facts, things you learned. Try and get, um, you know, what, are, what is some of the most pertinent information that you pulled out of it? Um, so an example, the Academy ratio is 1.37 to 1 and was established uh, in 1932. Little typo. Um, second example, aspect ratio is measurement of width uh, by height of the screen established from the use of 35 millimeter film. So just whatever you can kind of pull. They're a little on the dry side, but you know what? It's 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 what it is. Yeah. All right, so that is your assignment. That will be due on the 23rd uh, by 9 p.m. Nothing too hard. Give you something to, to work on here. Um, here's that link again for the part two of assignment one. Sometimes links get a little dicey on Canvas. Don't know why, they just do. If for some reason you ever get a, uh, when you click on a link that I send, and this part's gray with a little face icon of a person like, I don't know, or whatever it does, uh, what you just need to do is click right up here on the title, and it will take you. So inevitably, I'll have about five people email and say the link didn't work that's why i didn't turn it in if it's not working let me know right away but this that clickety that you do right there will get you there again don't know why it happens i think it's if i copy it from a previous course it does it for some reason um yeah so i will post this lecture on here that should get you going um till next week also I'll show you your film journal, and you'll be doing this kind of throughout the semester. You can do it at uh, any point that you want. Um, and I do encourage, I don't require, if you do find a group of people, it's like, hey, let's watch watch something tonight. We could do our a little report on this. That way we can talk about it, decide, come up with ideas. Totally fine with that. Um, but essentially, I want you to write um, five, I change it every semester. Yeah, five, 250 to 400 words. Um, and you'll just go over films that you individually watch. I might do screenings, like um, that's one other question probably next week I'll pose is, is there a good time not during class to do extra credit screenings or something like that? You could do one of your papers off of that. Um, but just going over kind of the overview, um, I want you to include terminology that we'll discuss in class, uh, vocab terms, things like that. What you will do is make those terms bold, and you will need to do that uh, two vocab terms per, per uh, paper. So something like um, the natural lighting in this film uh, helped to give it a softer, more realistic look. And then you'll, you'll bold natural light a term that we discuss in class later on. Um, keep it just double spaced. That MLA formatting is kind of um, what's important. If you keep it just as one document and then you'll label it, you know, uh, one of five, two of five, whatever, and the movie title that is with it, um, that will be, that's kind of how I want it formatted. Don't worry, I have posted an example for you to follow as well. Um, from other students and it gives you a good idea of what they need to look like. Um, again, two terms of vocab or stuff that we discuss. Um, the, it shouldn't be about the plot or the summary of the film. It should be the execution of how the film was made um, is kind of the first part. And then the second part is what do you as a film critic, what do you think of the film? Again, not the plot. So if I was doing Forrest Gump, let's say, I would not spend a page talking about, he grew up in Alabama, he played ping pong, he went to Vietnam, he played football, and then his mom died and his girlfriend died, the end. You know, that's not your paper. I've seen the movie, right? What did you learn from it? That's what we're kind of going for. Um, so if there's a little bit in there, fine. 
not the whole thing. Um, I'm trying to even think of one to give. Pulp Fiction is an episodic film following the lives of these people during the boxing match. This happens during the gimp scene. This happens, whatever, right? Okay, so there could be a little bit, but I just don't, I don't want a book report on it. Uh, I want to know that you know the terms. Um, you can get a little subjective with it. I really like the way that they did this. I, I think this was good. I thought that was good. Um, whatever the case uh, might be. Don't plagiarize. Um, no, late work gets is accepted since, you know, excused absences or something coming up aside. Um, just a, hey, can I turn this in a little late? Nah, because I'm giving you all semester. Um, so just get it in as, as best you can. It's a little weightier. It's 250 points, whereas most of your papers will be 100. Um, I used to do this as, as 20. And I would tell people you can do multiple, multiple um, pages on one particular film. You could break down a scene. You could break down a character. You could do um, kind of anything like that. That is, oh, that's okay as well, as long as it's a page. So if it is a TV show, if it is an anime, um, if it's something kind of outside the classical Hollywood system, um, that's going to be okay. Not YouTube videos. It's got to be, you know, uh, sort of cinematic stuff. Uh, and live in that world, let's say. But now we can start getting into the, you know, TV shows and things like that. There, there I'm okay. Because one, that's, I know you're busy too. A 20 minute show versus sitting through Gone with the Wind or something like that is, is kind of different given on how busy uh, you are. So if you have questions about it, let me know. Some people get kind of clever with it. Some people include um, screenshots, pictures, things like that. That's fine. It doesn't change, you know, a picture is not worth a thousand words in this case, so you can't just turn that in and it covers up how many words you're using, but it certainly helps. For your reference, here's some examples. You can see up at the top, this is back when I, you would have, it drove them crazy because it'd be 20 pages. Um, after a couple years of people complaining so much, I lowered it down to 10, they were still complaining, so... I was like, all right, give me five. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, the title of the film and the number that you're on, it just kind of helps me stay organized because this does come at the end of the semester. So I am, I don't want to say grading fast, but, um, you know, there's a lot of people to go through, a lot of other classes, a lot of essays. That was one of my other things is, you know, if I had 30 kids all writing 20 page papers, it was a hell of a lot of stuff to grade at once. But if you do this, it helps keep you organized and it helps keep me organized. You can see how little things um, italicizing the name of the film and you can see the terms are in bold. You can of course do more. Um, this person chose to do three. That won't count against you. Um, and then you can see the next one that they did. Um, without these, it just can easily break like where I'm confused, are you talking about film one or film two? Especially if you're looking at the same film, like maybe you're doing the director of the film talking about their stylistic, st even stuff like that, I'm okay. Like the films of David Lynch, the films of Kubrick, um, whatever the case might be. But if you happen to be doing the same film, then I definitely need to do this. Then you, you need to break it up. Everyone needs to break it up anyway, but you can see how easily if this wasn't here, it could get confusing as to what you're talking about. But again, you can see bold terms um, throughout and there's nothing much more to it than that. All I would suggest is uh, I wouldn't wait until the uh, end of the semester to do it. That will be uh, an unfun process for you. I think that is all the uh, nonsense and, and such. Uh, here's stuff for writing your papers, MLA formats, the rubric and uh, grading your papers, things like that. You can look it over. I, pr I Just to show you again, um, late assignment one, late assignment two, this is just for assignments. This is not the film journal. This is not essays. This is not tests. If there are assignments that come up and you need to turn them in late, here's a uh, late work form that you'll fill out what it is, blah, blah, blah. I think I gave the illustration how like if my company we extend our taxes, the tax company makes us write something. So it's just a little bit of prep for that. Um, and it's not much, your name, assignment, total points, uh, briefly explain why it's late. If you don't wanna tell me, I don't really care because it's, it's yours to use. Um, if you don't use these, I give extra credit. 
Um, and there's the overview outlining what would be acceptable. So like assignment one, yes. Uh, the quizzes, no. Um, but if you need to like, I, I have a super busy week, uh, my team's traveling or whatever, um, you know, just turn it in here. Um, you might get the zero to start, don't freak out. I will try to get to these at the, at the midterm and at the end of the semester. Before that, don't help me to grade it, um, but just know that the points will get there um, for you. Okay, any questions on any of that? Fairly straight? I got a question. Sure. So the essays, like four pages? How long, how long is it? Who could help him out? What did I say? Five pages. How long do they need to be? 250 words, 400. There you go. 400 words? 250 to 400. Words? Yes. So that's roughly five pages, but that's due at the end of end of the semester. Other question? I feel like I saw one more hand. All right. But yeah, whenever you don't know too, go back and, and look it over and it's usually there. Sometimes I'll do an overview of a module um, and just record it and put it there. So you'll just see it as a module overview. If you look at that, that will be me more concisely putting out what you need to do. Uh, did everybody get a chance to sign, sign themselves in? Thank you. Got a few people missing. Jonathan? Okay. I just saw Dash. You're here today, though. <laughs> oh, you signed in on the other side. That's why. All right. <clears throat> Who's ready to talk about movies now? Anybody ever acted in here? No. Is that what acting is? In a, in a way, yeah, but it's all a matter of perspective depending on what element you can basically view within the acting and such. It's such a wide variety and dependent on basically the actor and the direction of the film. Yeah. I would say it's, the, he, it was kind of interesting when I watched it. It's pretty damn funny. Um, one of the greatest actors on the planet, 
you know, talking about his role in uh, a touchstone of a film that kind of defined an era. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting. It's like film is all a lie, right? Is film a lie? I guess some, uh, some way, yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. Uh, it also doesn't have to be a lie. You can basically um, take elements from basically the realistic world and try to apply it within that world, try to create on my a concept or basically a illusion of um, real realism and such. Mm -hmm. But that can also uh, be um, uh, you know on the opposite spectrum. We can use like fantasy, like for example, Lord of the Rings. That call me crazy, but we don't have giant um, uh, dragons and also orcs and everything, and we're not in Middle Earth, are we? Yeah. All right, I saw a couple more hands up. Was your hand up? What do you think? Is film a lie? I'm pointing right at you. Is film a lie? Somewhat. Sometimes. Sometimes. Um, it could be someone's imagination, but at the same time, it could be, like, the reality. It could be based on a true story. Mm -hmm. It depends on how you want to make the film or how you want it to be. Yeah. I'd agree. Mm -hmm. and, but you'll have to get into the right detail, mm -hmm. or you can do it like in current day, mm -hmm. like Shameless, like Shameless did. When they, uh, when the virus, was, the virus was going around. Mm -hmm. They, uh, and, uh, they and put the virus into the script of the final season. Mm -hmm. Like that, like you can make the film real to an extent. Right. I would agree. Yeah. Uh, um, so. In a way, some films can tell be truthful to you, like when it's a real life event. But mm -hmm. other times, it feels like they're just going to be telling some action packed adventure story that you probably won't even witness in real life. Sure. So, in a way, films can be truthful. But other times, they're lying to you. Yeah. Well, and, and even, okay, think of this. You all just watched that scene, right? Mm -hmm. Were we really there? No, of course not, right? You're staring at a flat surface, yet you're able to see dimension. You're able to see depth. It's almost like you're looking into that world, but it, it's not. It's, it's not that world. We will accept it. We will accept that that's Ricky Gervais and Ian McKellen that's there. That's not them, right? It's not really them. It is encoded material that's brought together edited and put back out as though it were real and we will accept that it is real and that there is something uh more profound and i think that's where everybody was getting at the truth lies not in the the product itself the making or construction of the product but how we consume it how we interpret it and and things like that which is very true um but it, it's kind of crazy if you, it's funny to watch after you've seen a movie to watch the making of it because in a, in a really weird way, there's a tiny, even if you really like it and are really excited about how they did it, there's a kind of tiny letdown, right? This wasn't real. These were just people. This was, this was uh, someone with uh, an actor. This is Jake Gyllenhaal doing a scene and there's probably 150 people around him staring, uh, crew, other actors, um, you know, stuff like that. Whoever might be there staring at this person as a device is capturing light and digitizing it or, or absorbing it onto the surface of a film plane. And, and then that, and so many steps go into it before all that, right? Your wardrobe, your hair and makeup, um, the lighting, everything, production design, all these things come together from people to create a reality that we assume is real so that we can pull those bigger truths out of it. But it's crazy if any of you feel like going into the film industry, how you start to realize it's a lie. It's a weird lie. Like it's what's up there and what it took to get it are completely different things, right? So you, I don't want to say you get jaded as a filmmaker, but you realize wow, this is crazy because it's so powerful because we are looking for those deeper truths. We are looking for that reality. We are looking for what that is to believe it. So we want it to be real. We want it to be true. Um, 
Let's see. Who am I going to pick on? Why do you watch film? I barely watch film. Barely watch film? Yes. All right. Well, when you do, why do you do it? Uh, free time. As so escapism? Yeah. yeah. Kill a little time? Um, I feel like sometimes film can be more educational than school can be. Sure. Like, you can learn things, like, on a personal, spiritual level. Like, uh, movie puts in books, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's 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 very true. I remember somebody telling me they came out of Finding Nemo, and the husband turned to the wife and said, "Am I a good dad?" Right. So these animated things um, can can pull these emotions out of you, like that are so crazy. These deep thoughts and these deep concerns of life, and they're not real. They're a thing, right? You wouldn't even say they're a thing. They're they're light being projected in some way. What you got? I would say basically all, like whenever I watch film, I usually I'm a, it just boils it down to basically the message and basically the whole and plot and um, the story that it's trying to portray and the message that's within the story because the devil is kind of in the details and such for basically, I'll use Finding Nemo for an example. Mm -hmm. It's basically a story about um, a, a father basically um, uh, who doesn't know how to like, you know, some his son right but then I'm um, like get separated and then you know that's basically find him basically ever heard of um, uh, the um, process called the hero's journey yeah we will we'll talk about that a little bit I usually think of that whenever I think of films and such and I think that's such a key important thing remember that because when we get to narrative that's what we're gonna be working on something like that but we we go to film for different reason we go to it to to educate ourselves we go it to kill time um, you know, escapism. Story is, uh, you know, what we need to really, I think, make sense of everything. We're a we're a story driven uh, species, and I think that's why they're so prevalent. When we were back at whatever stage of um, you want to go to uh, in the existence of humans, cognizant human beings on this planet. And story became important. Don't go drink out of that water, right? Somebody died, they drank out of it. So we tell this tribe, well, that becomes a thing of this pond is cursed. We don't go over there because it's cursed by this thing. So we avoid this area, right? So story became an interesting way of us communicating towards our survival. And if we look back at all the, the oldest tradition or all the oldest uh, civilizations or anything that's out there, look how much their oral tradition and story is important. Um, I can't speak to all faiths because I have not studied them equally, but someone who was, you know, of the Christian persuasion, I look at how much of that is story being told, right? Jesus told stories to get a point across, to make people understand. So if it's, if it's just kind of been who we are as a species. And as we kind of study the history and we see that film first started out as just projections on a screen that were like, cool, this looks like people moving. This looks like uh, things happening. This is exciting. Well, now we start to realize if I combine this shot with this shot and this shot with this shot, it tells a story and people are more engaged and people are uh, focusing. Um, think of this too. This is a big one. I, I don't have any kids now, but I have uh, eight. Uh, I got six nephews and two nieces, all from the same family. My brother's got a really big family. They are wild about stories before they go to bed. Absolutely wild. If any of you have younger siblings or maybe have kids of your own, there's something about as a child being read a story from an authority figure saying this is life. To some extent, I think they like that even more than the film that I've seen from kids. If they had a choice between you reading them a story and them watching a film, a lot of times they'll go with the story. Not always, because again, I think there's something in that that we don't even realize. I mean. 
it's not the same as I know I need to drink water to survive, but I know there's something very critical about stories and the role that they have in my life. Um, but even down to our families, our friends, things like that, we share story on a daily basis. We have stories like my family, we get together and they'll want me to tell the same story about something that happened all the time. They've heard it 50 times, but they want to hear it again. It's like that same movie we go back to. It's comforting. It's fun. It makes us feel a certain way. But even look down at your social media posts that you put out there. How many of those are stories in some way? How many of them, even just a picture, it's telling some kind of story about something that happened to you today, something you heard about, or things like that. Again, not all of them, but it's a way of, of telling uh, a story. Some of you are international students. You have cultural stories, stories from uh, where you come from that are ingrained in the culture. We have some here, our folk heroes, people like that, that there's stories that we just traditionally um, have. Be it true or not, they're ingrained in our culture. So what is our rule as viewers? Um, how do we uh, decide our thoughts and views on a particular film? Uh, so part of that is kind of watching a film a little bit like a detective. We're looking for very specific things. Um, we ask ourselves things like, what are our initial reactions? Sometimes it happens we watch a film, we might hate it at first. I just watched the menu, I had to stop it. I was like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And part of that was the hype before it. Everybody was saying it was great, it was great, it was great. And I just... Uh, but I might watch it again and be like, okay, I like it more. Um, so we sometimes look at our initial reactions and we sometimes look at what's worth a second look, right? If we're truly dedicated to learning more and growing more as film, we find films that we, we need to uh, watch more than once. We can ask ourselves, was the story good? Was it complete? Was there something lacking within it? And I think the biggest problem with a lot of films now, it's not the graphics, it's not the acting, it's the story. The story is just way off. And we'll kind of get into it um, more as to why that could be. Um, was there a purpose to the viewing? You know, when I ask you, you're busy, you got other things going on in life that are probably more important to, to a large extent, right? So you're probably selective with what you watch, would you say? To a certain degree, yeah. So us becoming, you know, selective. Was it worth our time? We we have from the day we're born, we have a set amount of time on this planet. Staring at a screen is not what we were created that to, to do. You know, it's a part of our life. It shouldn't be all our life, right? So I'm not saying that to not watch film, but being selective in in what we do. So when we get through it, was it worth it? Beyond the realm of did I enjoy it? Because there's films out there I might have enjoyed. Was it worth it? I don't, probably not. It, I might be a little dumber for having watched it. Ever hear the Jackass movies? Oh, yeah. yeah. Ain't nothing good ever come from those films. I'm oh, just saying. Yeah. We might laugh. We might enjoy. I might weep for humanity that this is what's fun. I did a, a, a show once, a reality show, and our safety inspector was the safety inspector from the Jackass show. I'm like, how did they have one? Like, what was the point? Um, now, this is the biggest, um, biggest question you should think of. Did a character or characters or somehow, did we go from a positive to a negative or a negative to a positive? Right? So, what I mean by that is... Uh, let's take a, uh, a state of being such as from the positive in love. What is the negative or the opposite of in love? Apathy. Heartbroken. Heartbroken. Yeah. Um, well, I'll keep going so we don't have to cross this river. But uh, we have someone in love to someone heartbroken. I guess if I'd said, we have love, we have hate. We have growth, or we have resentment. resentment. What else? Something's growing or something's 
Sure, I'd take that. Decaying, right? What is our status of us? We get done watching a film and I say, how am I a better person for having watched that? That's what, even the, even the stuff that might seem um, just for the entertainment value, how have I changed because of this? And that's really what we're kind of going for too. Um, but it's also looking at a character. And these, uh, these changes, this growth, this change should come almost at any given moment, right? It should come in scenes, in acts, and throughout the whole film. So this is from, how are we doing on time? This is from a film called uh, Schindler's List. All I want you to do is watch the character that we're following and see, see if you can find that negative to positive or positive to negative. What is his status as a character in the beginning what is it in the end? Okay, I'm gonna come back to this later on, so um, just be aware of that. Okay, your attention on screen, so if you could close down phones and anything like that.
Okay, so what I want you to do, <clears throat> just turn to people around you for one minute. I want you to talk about those, uh, what we had talked about. What are his two statuses? The beginning and the end. Where does he go from in the beginning? Where is he at? Like his status update. His status update in the beginning is this. What is his status update at the end? Take one minute and I'll, I'll start pointing people out. You can let me know. But find out what you figured out. All right, let's see. Who haven't I heard from? What did you What did you come up with? Um, yeah, we kind of uh, <coughs> a little bit on the music uh, from his, like, seeing his emotion beginning towards the end, like, as his, uh, yes, like, as he started changing from being more serious to a little bit more, again, I don't even know what you would say, but I'm serious, the music also increased the tempo and the the beat was a little bit higher. Yeah. We'll actually use this clip for um, when we start talking about the camera, too. But I'm just curious, uh, since you brought up the music, and that actually becomes part of it later, what is that music? Or do we, anyone in here know Not what that is? Not the specific song. What genre does it fall under? Classical. Classical what? What kind of dance is it? It's a specific type of dance. Well, You're close on the waltz. It rhymes with Rango. Tango. Tango, yeah. <laughs> what is what is a tango dance? It's a dance of seduction. Yeah. He's trying to seduce these Nazi officers. So if you haven't seen the film, the context isn't really important to what we did. He, um, The Nazis have just taken over Poland, and Oskar Schindler has moved there. He's a German, and he wants to open up a business so he can make a lot of money. Um, and later on, he will employ Jewish people who are living in the ghetto, uh, first because it was cheaper to hire them than Polish people, uh, but then he, uh, he starts realizing they're getting, um, there's a genocide going on, so he starts using it as a way for them to be workers in the war and they're safe from death. So if you have not ever seen Schindler's List, there's a reason it is continually in uh, the American Film Institute's top 10 films ever made. It is excellent. So that's when we meet him. Um, that's, that's, that's him just getting to Poland and trying to go out and, and uh, get these things. So let's see. What about up here? What did y'all notice? Mr. Buck. Yes. Um, is it Poland like the Ella against Greeks? Ella, Poland? Uh, yeah, that's one of the re when, when they attacked there, it kind of helped spark the war. Uh, but um, we're talking about like the way he, um, the way he just like his aura was in the beginning. He was kind of mysterious, mm -hmm. and then at the towards the end of it, he was more like a, a center of attention. He was everybody's. You could tell with the camera too, because like in the beginning, it wasn't showing his face or anything, and then it kind of once it showed his face, it's when it started like yeah changing. Yeah. So, put that into words. If you had one word to describe the beginning, it was it would be introvert. He is introvert. Introvert. By the end, extrovert. I think he's an extrovert throughout, but it goes goes kind of more than that. He goes from 
he walks in and sits down, right? And he sees the table, uh, he sees the people come in that he could obviously tell are important, right? The camera tells us he's looking at them. He sees the reserve sign. And he holds up money and the waiter comes over and is like, bring them over drinks. And the waiter says, who shall I say they're from? What did he say? The scene is from me. From me, right? That doesn't answer our question. The scene progresses throughout, right? And then that same waiter goes over to somebody, uh, goes over to that general, and the general asks him, who is that man? And he says, that's Oscar Schindler. So that waiter kind of holds the key for us. He goes from unknown to what? Known, right? That's a change in status. That's, that's love hate. You're known or unknown, right? You're at two, you're at opposite ends of those spectrum. So there's a change. So he had a goal, right? And we'll get into this narrative. He had a goal of meeting these people. And these are the steps he took to achieve his goal. That's what creates a change. Obstacles come in the way that thwart the goal, but he achieved his goal. That's what he wanted. He wanted to be known. He wanted to be popular. So next time when we watch it, you'll start to see uh, a few more of those things. But that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a status change, right? Or a value change, you can, you can interchange it with that too. We need to go through that when we watch a movie too. How did we change? And sort of that could be from ignorance to knowledge. From uneducated in an area to educated in an area. Um, we, need to, we need to find something that we pull out to truly, I think, uh, immerse ourselves in a story. All right, still a little bit to get through. Um, that clip was a little longer. If we have to carry this over into next Tuesday, that's fine. When we're watching a film, we like to look for the levels of meaning. Usually, this level, the surface level, is the only one we really find ourselves being aware of. Or uh, if we're talking with people after a film, I love to go see a movie and then sit down and talk with people after it. It's always a lot of fun. Um, but usually we kind of stick to this at the first, the surface level meaning. Um, you know, what is the point or reason of watching? What is the point in the movie? What is the surface level meaning of The Wizard of Oz? I, I'm gonna imagine most people have seen it. What is the surface level meaning of the Wizard of Oz. Dorothy says it. She just trying to get home. Yeah, what'd she say? Oh, Auntie M, there's no place like home. No place like home, right? We have a surface level meeting about home and, and, and what it is and the importance of it. We could draw a lot of kind of surface level meetings, but let's just take that one. It's what's there. It's the obvious thing, right? When we watch a film. We can look for the themes of a story, the deeper meaning, what's below the surface. Anybody know this film? Godfather. The Godfather, very good. We can pull themes out of that, right? The importance of family, injustice in America, different things like that that we can start to pull out that's a little bit deeper, deeper than what's on the, on the surface. It is also a great way of showing that change of a character from, from the beginning of a, a film to the end. Um, so we're look, we can look for deeper meanings, uh, the thematic uh, level of a film. We can also arrive when we're, um, this is kind of going over how do we analyze, how do we watch a film, how do we study a film, right? We can uh, enter an esoteric level of a film, meaning esoteric means kind of something um, like, you know, few people know, it's lesser known. So now we're talking about very specific things that you'd really have to know or watch a film a lot of times to either get or to see, hey, this director was trying to do this, 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 or this, right? Um, I love Stanley Kubrick films mm -hmm. um, because I can watch it and I'm always going to find something new. I'm going to find a thousand people on the internet who've analyzed it as well, who've come up with their own inter interpretations, their own meanings. They look for things like, well, there's a conspiracy theory that Kubrick shot the moon landing. Right? So if you've ever seen, anybody seen this? Yeah. The Shining. The Shining. Correct. Did he put things throughout the film to show the fact that he shot the moon landing? Yes. Some people think that. Right? <coughs> the little kid's wearing the, the thing that's got the rocket on it. This matches the launch pad. That's what astronauts... So there's different things like that. We can really go down a rabbit hole with this level. 
how far do I want to go in in the just the hidden things now we have sort of the Easter egg which is esoteric but it's also just like that's just kind of something fun they put in there you don't necessarily grow it doesn't it doesn't it's not always bad but it's like am I learning more about life and things from it so those are fun but not necessarily always essential and they don't always mean something usually it's just tied back to kind of something fun to create for the audience um, and then we kind of have this uh, the fourth level is analyzing the elements of what makes that film a film so all the formal elements um, all the components that make up the film the lighting the acting the directing sound costumes all that stuff kind of come together right and we can kind of create a visceral meaning from that so what do I mean by that So you don't really actually have to know much of what's going on at, uh, at a given point to take something like that and say, I could draw meaning from it. I, I know what's going on at least to the level of where the, the cues that they're giving me in the elements. Well, first is that sweeping music, right? That just draws us emotionally. We have someone peering out at, at the sun's setting, right? Which we kind of, we can equate to us looking off in the distance in our life, the sun is setting. Um, there's either hope, there's a lack of hope, there's a reason we're out there pondering life. We see the framing, he looks very small in one, one shot, very upset. But anyway, the point is, all these elements sort of cook together to create a meaning for us that I can then pull out. Them by themselves don't really mean a thing. If I have all these ingredients to make a smoothie, right? I get up in the morning, I have spinach, I have parts with apple, berries, the little powders I put on them, or whatever. By themselves, they are their own thing. Once I put them in the little ninja and hit the button and they cook together, it's individual components come together to make a smoothie, okay? So that's kind of like what that visceral level does. It's all the things come together to give us that deeper meaning with it. So when we analyze film, we're looking for all or as many of those levels as we can, right? So we're looking at the surface level, a thematic level. The esoteric is certainly not important, but it's fun to, especially if you're really engaged with the film. Find out what are those little things in it. Watch the making of it. Read what the director said. You know, see those things that are there. Watch the other people who've reviewed it, and they may have come up with something you didn't realize. Um, but then that fourth, the elemental stage, that elemental level, look at all the things, all those ingredients that were put together to create the smoothie that is that scene, that act or that entire film. So film is very powerful just in itself. I brought up the fact that we look on a flat screen at digitized light being projected back out. That is the image of, of what the object was or is. Um, it's a very powerful tool, right? Words on a page, we have to project it up in our mind. When we're reading a short story, we imagine what's going on. We follow along with it through that, that kind of uh, self-creating stage, right? That self-creating of what's going on. Film does it for us. We don't really have to work. It's doing the work for us, right? Um, and it's powerful at it, I think, too, um, because film can create uh, a different sense of time. It works outside of time, and it works outside of space. Um, again, that flat screen, we see depth and dimension. Sometimes you'll see famous paintings, um, like uh, really old pre-Renaissance paintings, right? Where it looks flat. It looks like something just painted on a flat surface, right? Well, then we had Michelangelo come along and he had a depth, he added shadow, he had a dimension to a painting, right? So it looks like you're not just looking at a flat surface, you're looking deep inside of something. 
and film has that same um, that same power to give us time and space in an altered way. This is kind of a fun example. Let me make sure we're doing good on time. From Indiana Jones, watch him on the conveyor belt. See what time does. See how film can manipulate time. What'd you notice? He was like right next to the thing for a long time. Yeah, he would have been squashed like, you know, 15 times in the, in the span of that scene. But we accept it, right? We'll go along with it for the sake of entertainment and the deeper truth that's kind of there. So. You also capture that dramatic tension. Yeah. You're helpless, you don't know what to do. But when you find the truth, that's why we like it. That's why we'll put up with it because we want that dramatic. We want that that entertainment value that uh, a movie like this gives you. Because so if they just do it, then it will, if they do it before, then it'll just, it'll, the, the effect wouldn't happen. Sure. Yeah. If you if you just had a long shot, just one shot of him going down the whole one, it'd be boring, right? It wouldn't be the same. Um, so we're we're willing to accept that film can alter time and space for the sake of our entertainment and growth, right? That's kind of what it is. Um, I'm gonna stop, let me just see. We're kind of close to the end, but I might pick this up. <coughs> oh, we have a bit more to go. I'm gonna stop there and we'll pick this up Tuesday um, where we are.